if you're going to lazily like just push out another variant, like maybe change the album art or something, like yeah, it kind of is a cash grab, and I would expect people to not partake. But if you're truly adding value, or you're making it a different experience, or you're trying to find ways you can improve upon it, where it would entice people who said no the last time, then I think you're in the clear. You are now listening to the Creative Juice Podcast, brought to you by Entrepreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice Podcast. This is episode 335, and today we're going to be talking about your online store, your products, and how to make the most of them. I'm your host, Jack McCarthy. With me today is Circa. Cirque, what's going on, dude? Not much, dude. I'm actually uh, mired in development work as our resident dev now. It's the most fun kind of work. Yeah. You and I were able to launch some sick features for the Indie CRM for all of our Indie Pro members. And so that's been going good. And it's funny, our our work has, has transitioned to be part development. I know. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. That's the kind of work that you can really lose yourself in. Yeah, for sure. I enjoy it a lot. Well, I'm psyched about this topic, man. Yeah. To talk about products and share a couple stories from the agency, which kind of inspired me and hopefully will give anyone listening Uh, a bit of a jumping off point when it comes to selling and how you think about your products and your offers and how you can make the most out of them and make them stretch out over time. Because I think it's a challenge that indies kind of across the board from people who are just starting out selling and maybe they only have a product or two or more established artists and bands that have something in particular that they're focusing on right now, whether that be a specific merch drop or a specific record that they launched and they're trying to figure out how to really squeeze the most juice from it. And I want to talk about some examples and some strategies today that you can use to make your products last longer, make them more appealing to different subsets of your fans, and ultimately how to drive more revenue in your business. So I'm psyched. (laughs) Yeah, I'm also psyched. And I think it's a super cool case study from which we can draw this inspiration. Time and time again, NDX has the perfect case study to go over a concept that it seems to also be, you know, something that indie artists of smaller sizes experience. So it's, it's cool that we had always intended for NDX to sort of be a great wellspring of ideas and solutions for artists of all sizes. And it seems to be that that's the case. So I'm excited to talk about it. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. I think day in, day out, there are lessons that kind of we see that apply from the very beginning stages of an artist. Even if they don't apply perfectly one to one, we can find sort of teachable moments and obviously certainly lessons that apply to more established artists and the types that we work with in the agency. So I'm excited to kick it off with, that's actually a good jumping off point. I'm excited to kick it off with kind of point number one when it comes to making the most of your products. And you see this kind of out there in the wild, but I think it's tempting to just look at this sort of strategy as a cash grab and it's really not. It's actually a very sound strategy and that is working in variants of your record in order to you know, make your selling cycle longer. And we have an artist at the agency that we've been working with for a couple of years now. And their first release with us, their first really big sales push with us from the e-commerce front was for a new record that they had released. And what we've done over time to continue the momentum of selling that record has been worked with them to spin out and sell variants of that record, both on CD and on vinyl. So different limited run variants of the record, different colors, alternate album art, all that good stuff that you often see with variant editions of records has done a really good job of consistently generating them revenue and making that sustainable over time as we reach new fans and also reach back out to existing fans and customers, people who want to collect them all, so to speak. And you see this with artists like Taylor Swift. You see this with people in top 40 all the time, but it really does apply, I think, all the way down. You can get a lot of mileage out of your products by implementing strategies like this. Yeah, it's funny because like, <laughs> like you went through all of the examples I would have used. Um, <laughs> I think 
just like you said, new variants of existing works, like they address two types of people, I think. One is people who just got to catch them all, right? So there are those people who want to collect everything. I, as a Misfits fan growing up, I had tons of friends who were Misfits fan who had everything, right? Same goes for like similar type bands like Kiss and, and ICP and people like, and even Taylor Swift. And then there's also a very, there's a cohort of people who didn't buy the last iterations. They missed out. They either missed out or, you know, the features of that variant just didn't speak to them or it's just a different time in their life. Right. And so this puts it back in front of them with fresh eyes and additional features to maybe entice them to take part in it this time. So I think that that's like two really good reasons why it's not like it's probably not just a cash grab. Like there's tons of people who might want to purchase this when previously they wouldn't have. For sure. Yeah. And I, I'd love to expand upon that a little bit and say one of the biggest creative features of spinning out variants to sell over time is that you can really get creative in putting together spinoffs of your product, your record or whatever, in ways that appeal to different subsets of your fans or different customer avatars. Maybe you know you have fans that love the color green and you've got fans that you know love, I don't know, let me just pick something random here, like fairy novels or something like that. You can spin out variations of your product that speak to those types of people. And then like you were saying, the person who might have missed out or the last launch just didn't speak to them this one might. And so it allows you to get creative in the ways that you make offers to your fans and who those offers within your fan base are right for. Yeah. You know, if you're going to lazily, like just push out another variant, like maybe change the album art or something like, yeah, it kind of is a cash grab and I would expect people to not partake. But if you're truly adding value or you're making it a different experience or you're trying to find ways you can improve upon it, where it would entice people who said no the last time, then I think like you're in the clear, you know? For sure. Yeah. And I think that that should really be a big part of the strategy if you're thinking about employing this is brainstorm ways to take people from a no to a yes. Yeah, exactly. You want to imagine in your mind like, okay, well, I have this many people on my email list and th only this many people bought last time. Why? Why did those other people... Why were they not interested? What can I add to this to make them enticed by it? Yeah, for sure. And another sort of age old marketing ism or question to ask yourself when you're coming up with variants or new offers is who gives a shit? Why should they care? If you can ask yourself that and you can't answer the question, then find a new hook, find a new thing to add, find a new variation, change it up a little bit more, go a little bit further to the left and figure out what you want to do differently. And that's a really good question to ask yourself. And I'm glad you sort of touched on that, sir, because it transitions us nicely into the next sort of strategy that I wanted to talk about when it comes to making the most of your products. And this is just the idea of reskinning offers in general. And it doesn't necessarily require you to make a whole new variant. It just requires you to change up the way that you're talking about your offer or adding different bonuses or testing different price points. And this really applies, especially if you're, let's say you're selling a record uh, around a calendar year and you're wanting to sell it in different sales promotions. Well, the first thing that you might want to consider doing is just changing the reason why you're making the offer. For example, you might be making the offer at Black Friday, right? That is your reason why it's a Black Friday sale. Cool. That's a reason why. Let's say five months later, it's your band or your birthday, your band's birthday or your birthday. I don't know if you're a solo artist, maybe it's your birthday. Your reason why might be it's my birthday or it's our birthday and I want to give you a gift. It's a different reason why. So you can think about the way that you reskin your offers as far as reason why goes, you can really find any reason why. We did a podcast about this a while ago where we were talking about never needing a reason to sell again. We can link to that in the show notes so that you guys can check it out. But this is just one element of reskinning offers that I think is important to think about. Yeah, I also think that like um, albums are not, they can be living documents, right? <laughs> 
they totally can. And I think Kanye West did his best to sort of play with this fact with The Life of Pablo, where he kept on modifying tracks after it was released to streaming. Yeah. He added some tracks. He also just wholesale changed the mix or even the arrangement on some tracks. And I think that's super cool. I also think it's cool to have different variations of your music and even the album as a conceptual piece, right? It might not be the actual songs that's different, but the arrangement of them or maybe adding in or removing songs and then sort of changing the album as a complete work instead of changing individual things. Yeah, yeah. There's all different ways to play around with the format and you have no idea what your most diehard fans are going to want to participate in and you have no idea what people on the fence are going to want to jump in on. Totally, yeah. Here's uh, two good examples of that, I think, from artists from our agency, NDX. Actually, this is the same band. We did this twice. Once, Black Friday, two years ago, they actually released a record, and as part of the Black Friday offer, it was coming with a holiday card, a Christmas card. And that was a you know limited edition sort of version of the offer that they were running, and it was only available at Black Friday. So there was that added bonus. The following Black Friday, different record, similar concept here to reskinning an offer, though. We had been selling this record of theirs for a while. And for this specific Black Friday promo, what they did was they spun out a different version and they added three songs to this EP. So again, like taking the idea of an album being like a historical document, they did exactly that. They added three songs to it uh, that had never been heard before and they sold it as you know, just part of this special offer. So again, reskinning something that was already existing. Yeah, there was a group, I forget exactly who it was, but when I was growing up, there was a group who my friend had an album of where in the first iteration of it, they didn't have clearance on some samples. And so they had to put back a new, they put had to put out a new version with those samples scrubbed, but they also changed around some things about the mixes and they changed some words in different songs. And it's not really clear why, but those are early ones became collector's items. And so did the second variant, because sure enough, they put out a third version that was sort of this official release. So like first was a mistake. Second was a patch. Third was the stable release. Oh, that's really interesting. Their fans own all three or they try to super cool. <laughs> yeah, that's super interesting for sure. And another, this kind of relates as well is like, if you were viewing those as different additions, or even like if the mistake was like a test pressing, those are all good examples of where an offer can be reskinned around the price as well. And you can really test like price resistance among your fan base, limited edition runs or test pressings work really well, where you can then test out the price of something, uh, add on bonuses and make that the reason that you're doing it around a certain time frame. So that's something else that you can do when it comes to reskinning offers is play with the price just based on the reason that you're doing it or the quantity or the scarcity of the actual offer. Yeah. Tell me about sort of the different things that you've seen at the agency as it pertains to this. What are all the different strategies that have been used successfully to like modify a product? Man, (laughs) that's a loaded question. (laughs) Well, we've already talked about a few, right? We've talked about limited edition variant runs of CDs of vinyl. We've talked about CDs with added bonuses in them. So like the holiday card example, we've talked about records with additional songs added. There was actually another example one time. This was sort of an accident, actually. Um, But if you've ever had, I want to mention it because if you've ever had a pressing gone wrong, where, for example, there was a, a mistaken track listing or the track listing on the actual record is mismatched from the album art or the official track listing, we actually had a, a a client that did an unboxing and they realized on the live stream that that it was wrong and their fans flooded the store to get the incorrect, basically mistaken version of this record. It was wild. That's great. <laughs> they were probably freaking out in the moment, but it was a it was a huge hit. So I mentioned that to say, like, if you ever have a a mistake and you're pressing, don't just throw them out. You can try to sell them. <laughs> that was a really interesting one. 
that we saw happen. And this also applies to, this goes beyond just physical music products like CDs or vinyl. This can go into soft goods as well. You know, think about variations of merch that you can sell, um, different color tees, uh, hoodies versus t-shirts, all of that kind of stuff. Inversions of the artwork or changes in the artwork, you can add in Easter eggs into actual design which is kind of cool. You can add in personalization elements to designs. Actually, one of our account strategists years ago for a Black Friday sale, she handmade a limited edition of merch related to a song that she had dropped. And so it was all tied together with what was going on in her release cycle at the time. But she basically went and thrifted a whole bunch of handmade flannel. And that worked really well to take design from the album, or I think it was a single at the time, designed from the single and putting it onto merch in a limited way. So again, like on the concept of stretching out your products, she took something that was current in her release cycle, put it onto another product and launched a limited run of that. So you can kind of like make adjacent moves that way. So that's another example that I think is pretty cool. Yeah, I also think there's a part of this we haven't examined yet, which is the backwards facing effects, right? So like going forwards, you have added another variant people could purchase, but going backwards, you have an opportunity every time you do this to commit to say that last one, it's gone. Yeah. I'm not going to print it again. And so automatically, just by releasing a new variant, you've made the old variant scarce. That's true. You've added value to something people already own. Any inventory you have left can be sold at a premium or only sold when you really feel it's right. Say, I got these last copies and I'm not going to sell them until some kind of special thing happens. That's true. With every change, with every variant release, you kill off (laughs) the old variant and you say, this is what we've got left. Or if they're gone, then they then they're gone. There's none left. You're not doing it again. And you're right. That sets a precedent for your fan base as well. That like what's scarce is actually scarce. And I think that that's pretty cool. Yeah, I think that's sick. It's definitely something that m- adds collectability to what you're doing, and it gives you clearance in a lot of ways to do it. Right. All the people who own the old thing will be less upset that there's a new thing if the old thing they own is now more valuable. It's a scarce resource. For sure. Yeah. This is just a sidebar. But when that happens, when you sell out of this kind of stuff, you should talk about it. You should say that it happened. And I think this is something that a lot of artists get wrong. When you sell out, tell your fans that it's sold out. It's okay to do that. It's not bragging. It's letting them know because what that will do is that sets a fear of missing out in place for the next time that you drop something. And I think that that's really important to keep in mind. It can be a really critical lever to pull when it comes to setting yourself up for success for subsequent launches or promotions. So definitely keep that in mind. That's just a quick tip. Yeah. The last thing that I want to talk about when it comes to making your products last longer or getting the most out of them actually has less to do with new product creation or offer skinning as it does to do with the actual management of advertisements around your existing offer. This comes from a client story, a client that we've been working with for a long time at IndieX, that we've been selling his records for really like years. Like his his cycles, his release cycles have been a bit longer. It's a legacy artist and they have a pretty long sales cycle. The production is a bit longer, a bit more expensive. It's, he's not really in like the release music super fast, drop a lot of singles sort of mode of operating. So we really need to make the most of his release cycles. And so a lot of our work in making sales continue along and be sustainable has to do with creative testing, making his ads continue to work. So this looks like, you know, changing your hooks changing your ad copy, changing your videos, testing new colors, testing new images. And this can really go a long way when you've got something sustainable that is working to generate you revenue. And when I say sustainable, I mean like you've got a campaign that is you know, generating you a positive return on your advertising budget. 
what you want to be doing and keeping in your head is like, I need to have another campaign on the side that I'm using solely for testing out new ad creative, new hooks, new copy, new messaging. And truthfully, like you can apply any of the things that we've talked to in this episode to that strategy as well, which is cool. Is like you can test out reskinning your offers. You can test out different variations of your product in this advertising testing campaign. So that's why I wanted to mention this last is like everything that we've talked to up till now also applies to the advertising side, but it's definitely an important and separate part as well. Yeah. It's kind of free, right? The real cost associated with doing this that you weigh against all the benefits we've gone over is if it's t-shirts, it's a new screen. If it's, if it's CDs, like it's actually not much because it's not as if there's a high degree of transfer from one CD run to the next in terms of setup costs. No, it's like nothing. It's like nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So there's very low cost to doing this in terms of like, Hey, when I'm out of inventory, I'm just going to roll it. I'm not going to create the old one again and replenish inventory. And then there's like design costs that you might incur. If you can keep design costs low, the benefits definitely outweigh the drawbacks here. For sure. Yeah. And then if we talk about the cost of testing new ad creatives, new hooks, new copy, there's very little testing cost involved in that. You've got your ad spend and maybe you have some duds. Naturally, you're going to have some campaign tests or ad tests that just bomb and that's okay. You learn that lesson pretty quickly. You know, those don't take long to prove themselves. And as ad platforms get better and better and better, it, the, the time span of testing is going to get shorter and shorter and shorter, which is great. But that can definitely help you to mitigate cost as well. So if you're a thrifty indie and you're looking to not outlay into more inventory, and that's just not something you can do right now, or maybe you're saving up for that next variant push, then maybe the strategy you do pull from is, okay, how do I get more juice out of the ads that I'm running? Well, you think about your creatives, you think about your copy, you think about your hooks, and you test there. And actually, cool story from the agency as well related to that artist I was just talking about. Our testing campaigns for them now actually outperform our longer term sort of stable campaigns, which is cool. So now they've, now they've both become stable. The testing campaign actually outperforms in, in terms of uh, driving sales, which is cool and driving people over to their store. And so we're in the place of needing to continue to strike up additional tests to try and beat those tests and then move them all into the kind of winning stack. This is getting a little more tactical than I want to necessarily go down, but it's just to say like, you can do a lot of damage just at the level of testing different elements in your advertising and your marketing. So don't discount that in terms of how to make your products go a lot longer. Yeah. Well, I hope this was helpful and I hope you guys dug this, especially if you're going into a release cycle and you're trying to figure out how long can I really make this last for? Probably a lot longer than you might be led to believe. So hopefully this gives you some insight from the agency, from the processes and strategies that we pull from, from our clients, and also some of the case studies and the wins that we've had. I hope these three sort of big picture strategies help when it comes to you know spinning out variants, reskinning your offers in different ways, and just doing different tests in your advertising and your overall marketing. Yeah, and hopefully this is super actionable for you guys. If you're planning to print something or you're running out of inventory on something, like you could put this into practice immediately. For sure, yeah. That was definitely the hope with this topic and episode. So I hope you guys dug it. We'll catch you next time on Creative Juice. Go sell some stuff, Indies. Peace. Uh-huh. Can y'all really feel, feel the East Coast, feel, feel the West Coast.